sorry, what's the similarity or difference with Baha'i faith and Sufism? Uh, you know, I actually cannot answer that question because I don't know enough of about the Baha'i faith uh, to be able to give you, I think, to do justice to something like that. Uh, I'm sorry. I have several questions. I'm um, just curious why has um, Sufism not become a mainstream, as a mainstream, become a mainstream Islam? I mean, there's so um, so many parallels with um, Indian religions. And was Sufism um, under the influence of Indian religions um, at some period of time? So monasticism, contemplation, and meditation. Sure. Uh, thank you. I think in answer to your first question, why it hasn't become part of mainstream Islam, it's actually very difficult. Uh, most of us go through our lives uh, as humans and uh, we make mistakes, we do things we shouldn't do, and we don't hold ourselves to the kind of high standard that a Sufi sets out to achieve. And while being a Sufi doesn't mean that we cannot participate in normal secular life. There are many, many Sufis. Today uh, you can go to bookshops and pick up uh, books of practicing Sufi, Sufi leaders who are very successful in their own uh, chosen fields of life. But certainly they hold themselves to certain standards which are quite difficult for uh, the everyday person to uh, adhere to. Uh, many of us are unwilling to make the sort of sacrifices that are required to do that, whether that is uh, in uh, material welfare or goods, or whether it's in time uh, as far as these rituals or practices are concerned, the prayers, etc. So I think the simple answer would be that it's not an easy task, it's not an easy path, and also not everyone is aware of uh, this and uh, in that sense, perhaps the uh, quote secretive or hidden nature of Sufism sometimes gets it into trouble as well because people don't really understand it. So that's the first question. The second question uh, uh, to rephrase was, if I understand correctly, to what extent were uh, the influences of Indian uh, religious practices, uh, to what extent did they pervade Sufi Islam, is that? Yeah. Well, uh, I think that the answer uh, will vary from school to school. Let's not forget that there are Sufi orders in some of the individuals that I quoted in the first slide where I had the quotation about what it means to be a Sufi. I will also be uploading the presentation on the net uh, so if people uh, at later stage want to access it. Um, some of those individuals, in fact most of them, were from Sufi orders in the Arab world. Uh, which grew up independent of many of the Sufi practices that we have in uh, the subcontinent or South Asia. Uh, and many of the Sufi practices, which we ha orders which we have in South Asia or the subcontinent, trace themselves back to Central Asia. So what I'm trying to suggest is that while some of the modern practices that you may find in particularly today in parts of Pakistan or South Asia will have explicit and overt influences from uh, the, uh, uh, the practices of other religions in India. Uh, it's not across the board and it's certainly not something that happened from the beginning because uh, take the whirling dervishes. Uh, they, uh, they actually formed in a part of the world which had very little linkage at that point in time with the religious practices of the uh, uh, of the Indian religions. In fact, uh, one may argue, and some academics have argued, that there has been an interchange of knowledge between the Christian mystical uh, traditions and the Islamic mystical traditions. And for those of you who might be interested in theology, St. Thomas Aquinas is very well known for his seven proofs of God. Four of those proofs were actually uh, taken almost verbatim from uh, Muslim theologians, uh, some of whom uh, uh, were... Uh, so w 
that I bring that out only because uh, the exchange of knowledge between Islam and Christianity was actually uh, in some parts of the world formalized and uh, much greater than uh, between the informal exchange that took place in uh, the subcontinent or with Indian practices. Would you describe Prophet Muhammad as a, as a Sufi of his way of life uh, as a uh, I'll repeat the question for the audience. Would you describe uh, Prophet Muhammad of his way of life as him as a Sufi and his way of life as a Sufistic or, or being uh, consistent with Sufism in your interpretation? Well, uh, it's easy for one to argue and I will make the argument that he's actually would be then the ultimate Sufi. He's had umpteen religious experiences because he's had these experiences with, uh, with God. The Quran was revealed to him through uh, the angel uh, Gabriel, Arch Archangel, and uh, he has uh, had many um, uh, visions. Uh, and so the religious experience is there. He is to uh, Muslims and to Sufis in particular. Remember the second uh, uh, part of the prayer or, or the word was that we are uh, the, the blessings on the Prophet. So uh, uh, to Sufis, some of their orders will explicitly argue uh, that he is uh, insan -e kamil or there's another word phrase for it uh, which is that the ultimate uh, human. So if we were to take a role model and the Sufis do obviously take role models, he is the role model. So to that extent, um, it is entirely consistent with Sufi Islam to suggest that his life and his actions and what he did are uh, in consonance with Sufi Islam. And in fact, his behaviors uh, are a large part of what that Sharia, of course, is derived from, and that is very, very important to uh, a, a Sufi to be able to try and emulate that uh, behavior. So, definitely, I would argue that uh, that he would be the ultimate Sufi, and in in fact, uh, Sufis wouldn't even say that because to them that might be a little bit demeaning to the Prophet because. He's much more. He's the greatest um, human because of the various experiences that he's had and the sort of knowledge that he has imparted to the rest of us. So this is a potentially blasphemous and sacrilegious Sorry. question. Um, I'm just wondering, are, are there any orders in Sufism that makes use of the physical union between two persons to induce the divine union with, with God? Well, it, it's actually not such a blasphemous question. Uh, uh, I guess if answered incorrectly, it could be, but uh, um, no, uh, that's the first uh, answer. However, uh, particularly Al-Ghazali, in his book, which in fact uh, I think uh, I have here, oops, uh, uh, in one of his, uh, okay, I will try and uh, find it for you. In his uh, treatise uh, on the sciences of religion and the remembrance of death, he devotes several pages to the concept of union between man and woman and how uh, this is very important. Now, of course, all this has to be done in the, in, within the framework of marriage. Uh, and how uh, this union between man and woman uh, is has to be between two souls uh, and it is not something that should be taken lightly. So the concept of union is definitely not something you want to trifle with. Sufis are allowed to get married as are uh, uh, all uh, Muslim clergymen. Uh, and there is some 
thing to be said about the importance of union between man and God. But uh, if you are talking about something like, say, the Kama Sutra or something like that, I'm not even so familiar with the exact origins. Yes, but no, that's not. However, within the confines and framework of uh, marriage, uh, uh, that's uh, I think it would be considered acceptable uh, as long as it is for a particular purpose. Um, I've spent most of my life in the U.S. and you do have a lot of people that are fascinated with Sufism in the traditional sense that you've presented, but there's also a lot of people that are fascinated with it in a, almost a new age way where they would disagree with you have to follow the five pillars even or you have to be, you know, uh, give up materialism, etc. What's your take on all of that um, and that kind of new age Sufism that's there that's very universal and is more about love than any of the principles of Islam? Okay, Sufism is about love and if you talk about uh, uh, Sufi literature and that's why I brought up the concept of the heart right at the beginning because it's uh, if there's one thing about Sufism it's about love and the heart. Now, uh, you bring up this very interesting uh, uh, idea of New Age Sufism. What I've tried to demonstrate is that to be a Sufi in the real sense of the word hasn't really changed over time. Just as it hasn't really changed over time what it means to be a Muslim. Okay, Sufis are first and foremost Muslims. And uh, any Sufi order or any Sufi who is ordained or a part of a particular order will not challenge that notion. Okay? So, using that as a foundation, it is therefore a prerequisite for Sufis to adhere to the five pillars of God, uh, to the five pillars of Islam. Okay? Uh, Sufis in my opinion, will find it difficult to proceed towards f having any sort of religious experience or getting any sort of communion with God until and unless they are comfortable with themselves and what it means for them to be a Muslim. So to go beyond that stage uh, of being just a normal ordinary Muslim and many of us don't even pray or fast or do all the other things that we're supposed to do which is also why we don't necessarily go and become Sufis because you know that's a prerequisite so I would challenge that notion and I would say that uh, that I mean to be cynical a college student who's smoking uh, drugs in his dorm and reading Rumi and meditating and think he's a Sufi not really uh, uh, what we would call a serious Sufi, okay? He may have some, I some idea of Sufi literature, he may even think he understands a little bit, but that's why it is so important in the real Sufi tradition to have the Shaykh and the Murshid because um, we are not just at liberty to interpret and do whatever we please, uh, we can do that only within a given framework. So I would challenge that notion that you can't, that you can be a Sufi without adhering to the five pillars. The second part uh, is something which I don't think I said, so I and I don't think I implied, which is that Sufis can be uh, ordinary people taking part in secular life. So whether you're a successful lawyer or a musician, dare I say it, or any. Uh, uh, any other normal vocation there's no reason to suggest or believe that Sufis have to give up ma the material world and in fact even Islam doesn't uh, uh, Orthodox Islam will not uh, uh, call for that uh, and there is one particular order uh, the name of which uh, eludes me but I can find out if you're interested where the uh, the accumulation of wealth is actively encouraged provided that the wealth is put to certain good uses 
So material, giving up material is not uh, good or uh, taking yourself away from the uh, from social activity or normal society is not something a Sufi needs to do. If they feel that they must do it in order to achieve this communion because they want to live in a, uh, in a Sufi uh, school and go through the rituals uh, as regularly in a communal lifestyle, fine. But it's not necessary. Uh, while I am not a Sufi, I know many uh, who are and are doctors, uh, uh, lawyers and lead normal lives. Now of course, they don't claim to be having religious experiences because they don't, they are unable to devote the sort of time and effort uh, to it. But uh, so giving up material wealth, um, moving away from society is not necessary uh, or a precondition to be a Sufi. I think this gentleman here. Then. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Because uh, the Quran uh, only say one book we kicked up. And in chapter 40 verse 57, God says the creation of the heaven and the earth is indeed greater than, greater than the creation of mankind. But but on, uh, only Quran can guide us. Uh. But I notice all the books uh, like the human hadith and the human sunnah is from God. And it, most of them contradict the Quran. You get any? Uh, what is your view? Okay, uh, let me... In 25 chapter verse 30, Prophet Omar complained to God, my people reject the Quran. But behind it, he did not say, reject the Hadith of the Sunnah. And chapter 39 verse 20, chapter 39 verse 23, God said, God said, yes. send down the Ansana Hadith. Okay, the best let hadith. me first uh, see if I can understand your question uh, or your statement. Your statement is that uh, that the that this, uh, what I have quoted here is uh, contradicts the Quran. Okay, I don't want to get into arguments of theology or uh, debates about theology because they're never ending. Uh, what I will say is that, and this is my own belief as well, uh, that uh, Islam is a uh, pragmatic and dynamic religion and no one questions the sanctity of the book. Uh, the Quran or uh, the uh, Prophet and the Hadith uh, and the Sufis in their various uh, orders and schools do not do so either. In fact, uh, this is why I talk about Al-Ghazali and this book The Remembrance of Death and, uh, and the Afterlife because I think similar to what you were suggesting within the mainstream of Islam and he wrote his book about uh, I would say in the 11th century okay <laughs> until he wrote his treaties most Muslims were quite um, they felt similarly to you meaning they were unsure about whether this these Sufi practices were Islamic or not he wrote this treatise and he did a great service to Islam and what he did was that he was able to synthesize the practices of many Sufi traditions and orders uh, with what was then Orthodox Islam. So while I don't want to continue a debate, what I would suggest is that, uh, that if you have not already done so, that you may want to uh, uh, pick out uh, the remembrance of death and, and the afterlife by Al-Ghazali because and there are good translations available in English if you uh, if because you uh, in chapter 70 verse chapter 70 verse 88 God say if all the human and gene combine all together to produce a Quran cannot produce it no I, I agree <laughs> but as I said I don't want to go uh, because we will have a never ending debate and I, I think perhaps people um, may have other questions uh, and uh, maybe, the other maybe I, I give you to you Yes, and the other thing that I would say, of, of course, is that uh, because Islam doesn't have a, uh, a bureaucracy or a clergy, uh, what it means is that Islam is a very personal religion. Uh, you may have heard of Maulana Maududi, who is quite conservative in his thinking. He, in fact, uh, argued in uh, one of his papers that all it takes, and he's very conservative, he's, a, he's not a Sufi or, in fact, if anything, he tends towards the uh, uh, austere Wahhabi Islam. He argued in one of his papers that all it takes to be a Muslim 
is for someone to stand up and say, I am a Muslim and I believe in the unity of God and the finality of the prophethood. No one else, no other human after that has the right to challenge that individual's assertion because then it becomes into the domain of God and him or her. So I think I'd, be, I'd rather leave it there and say that um, uh, there are as many paths to heaven as there are souls on the world, which is another Sufi um, saying that I didn't quote here. <laughs> Please. Thank you, sir. <coughs> My name is Joseph Khan. I have an uh, observation and two questions. Firstly, the observation is that uh, this is essentially an uh, isotheric aspect of uh, Sufism, and there are um, uh, the isotheric aspects of the religion uh, transcends Sufism. So in our words, uh, what I feel is that you can still get a personal experience without going through uh, an organized structure. Um, that is that's my observation, personal observation. The two questions are uh, the topic on lifting the veil. Yep. What is this veil uh, in the context of today's talk? The second question that I have is can you comment on the work or, on the Gajif? G I Gajif. Okay. If you know this guy? No, I don't. Okay. No, so don't. in this case, I refrain from my okay. question too. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, firstly, thank you uh, for uh, the statement. I will not uh, disagree with you. Individuals can certainly have religious experiences uh, without having to participate in an order. Uh, and I think the purpose of the Sufi and the order is, excuse me, one, to try and enable or encourage those experiences and to make sure that when those experiences occur, uh, that what is taken away from them is uh, within a particular framework. So certainly uh, I wouldn't want to argue with that because as, uh, as uh, I explained through James's definition, a religious experience is a very individual thing and those four characteristics. And again, uh, let me say something else, which is that uh, I did allude to this, that, and this supports your notion uh, that there are many Christian mystics. So they are certainly not part of any Sufi order, but they are having religious experiences and I will be the last one to try and doubt the veracity of those experiences. So uh, certainly you don't need to be, but uh, as today's talk was about Sufi Islam and uh, lifting the veil, uh, it's just a, uh, I guess a, um, uh, not technically a metaphor, but perhaps a phrase saying that, uh, uh, an allusion to the, the Islamic veil and the fact that in today's world, I mean, uh, that gentleman over there talked about New Age Sufism. Almost every college student in the U.S. probably has uh, uh, has sent um, uh, love notes to their girlfriend from Rumi or from uh, Umar Khayyam or something like that. And of course, they, uh, as I said, uh, uh, they have some romantic notions of what it means to be a Sufi and the fact that you know because their poetry often refers to drinking and getting drunk and this and I mean those are all allegories or those are symbolism so uh, what the it was a very uh, simple uh, idea to try and entice uh, people to uh, to attend uh, the talk that's it uh, nothing deeper <laughs> Hi, I would like to know, do you think uh, Sufism has been commercialized in some parts of the world and do you think this is something to be worried about? Uh, yes, uh, I think that to some extent uh, it has been commercialized, uh, but I would hesitate to say how far, okay? Uh, but then I would add very quickly that in my opinion, okay, we live in a free society, free world, and while it is dangerous to allow individuals to head religions, if you want to call it uh, that, or to, to speak on behalf of a religion, I think ultimately uh, we must allow individuals to find their own uh, paths. And therefore, uh, if individuals are trying to commercialize, we come back to this concept that I, uh, I explained of the silsila and the fact that 
if someone is going to try and be a real, follow this path in a real sense, that they will probably very quickly realize the difference between a, a Sufi order that is has very little substance to it and a sheikh that doesn't really know. Uh, so, for example, if I were a sheikh, I probably would have been able to answer most of these questions uh, uh, in a, like the gentleman about the gear, uh, the no, the gear geish or the the author that you're talking about, the works. Yeah, uh, but I'm not, and I don't profess to be, and I'm certainly not heading any order, uh, and I have no mentee. So, uh, it's, I'm more on the notion of like be, of it being a tourist attraction, or of it being you know more of a revenue generating. You know, do you think this is something to be worried about? I mean, that's a good point, but again, no. Uh, and I would even go so far as to say that uh, that. Uh, that the Prophet himself, and one of the reasons why the Kaaba is uh, what it is today, is because uh, Mecca had been a center of uh, religious pilgrimage in pre Islamic times. And in order to make sure that the residents of Mecca, you probably know this, but in order to make sure that the residents of Mecca were not alienated, uh, he uh, agreed to the Kaaba as being a also a place where people could come for pilgrimage. So economically speaking, uh, pilgrimage, I don't see it as a major issue. So if we are talking about festivals around shrines and things like that, which are certainly occurrences all over the world, uh, I don't see it as much of an issue because there are tourists and then there are those. So we go and we watch a Sufi whirling the dervish dance at a community center or at a, uh, some place in Istanbul or something like that. I mean, we know it's, and the people performing also know what they're doing. So everyone's playing a role. It's a different thing to go into that Pekka or Tarika or school and uh, witness it the way it is as part of the ritual. So I don't really have much of an issue with that personally. Uh, because you know people have to make a living let them uh, do it and also it does spread awareness and knowledge and maybe some people are interested by it and it allows them to go a bit further it is an innocent question um, on top of the arts for obvious reasons um, has tourism contributed to the flourishing of let's say mathematics and sciences um, in the early period um, I'm sure it has in that I'm sure that there have been many individuals who are uh, successful or pioneering mathematicians and scientists who consider themselves to be Sufis or influenced by Sufi thought. Whether I can come up with any names of a Sufi who developed the Pythagorean theorem or something, no I can't. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, ultimately we have to see where we draw the line. Uh, if uh, an individual was heavily influenced by Islam and um, Sufi Islam of a particular order and came up with a certain physics uh, rule or axiom, does that mean that it has contributed? Yeah, you mentioned that you will be putting up the slides on the website. Can you give us the address of the website? Thank you.